right, so today we're going to go ahead and cover the uh, installation of VMware. So uh, I've got a VM we're going to install to, and then I'm going to show you over in here the uh, IPMI for Supermicro. This is probably what you would use for a console, something like this, DRAC, or you know the the Cisco, what is it, CWAM or whatever. You know, you get you would go through the uh, management port for uh, lights out management uh, to get your installation completed. Uh, for a lot of people, you're able to go ahead and just ask a manufacturer, hey, can you install your particular version of VMware ESXi onto the host? Uh, for security purposes, usually the way that, that I like to do it is download the ISO, go ahead and get it scanned, make sure it looks good, make sure it meets up with checksums, all that good stuff, and then get it installed. So in general, when you're installing VMware, uh, one of the, the things that you want to make sure of is that if you have a particular uh, flavor, like a, a Dell, then you're going to want to make sure you get that Dell uh, inst installer directly from the Dell website. <clears throat> now the VMware li Lifecycle Manager should maintain your patches properly. But we can see in here the page, this is an already installed version. Uh, so for installation you would need console redirection. So you're going to need Java, definitely, if you're, if you're doing this on IPMI. Um, which is, you know, a lot of different companies, not just Supermicro, rely on IPMI. Uh, the IKVM HTML5, uh, this is great, but the problem is that you cannot pass through media. So the console redirection, you're able to go ahead and launch the console. Let's go ahead and run this guy. All right, so what we would end up doing is going to the virtual storage. We would go ahead and tell it that we're looking in an ISO file, open the ISO file, go to wherever it is that we need to go. And then once that file is right there, we tell it to plug in. And then, you know, of course, we would have either the system off or already at that, you know, failed um, pixie boot. Uh, page that it that would come up and uh, we would go ahead and send the uh, control delete the since the ISO is plugged in it would get then begin its boot process so we're gonna go ahead and close that out so that's that's the uh, you know how you would get to it from your IPMI right? but how we're gonna get to it from here is we're gonna go ahead and power on There we go. So this is your your standard boot screen, you know. Setting up the the nested copy here, so this is going to go considerably faster than it would in, in you know the the regular world. All right. On these fresh new copies, uh, you know, where you don't have anything else set up in the background yet, this is always just one of the, you know, great things like, oh, all it has to do is load the kernel and start up the hypervisor. All right. So, and here we go. So, from inside this window, you know, the usual, hey, you're about to install this. We're going to go ahead and accept their license agreement. Now I've added multiple drives here and they're all the same size so that I can I can go ahead and point some things out. So we have what's listed in here, the ATA, so this is going to more than likely be a, a SATA drive. This is our SCSI drive. And then this should be an IDE drive. So uh, in the bottom one on the list here, the I that's right there in between VMware Virtual and the uh, uh, parentheses. I believe that would be IDE and then the S there would be SATA. So being able to identify where this is pretty important. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do the defaults here. And 
and then it should go ahead and, and run through all of this, perform the installation, and once the installation is complete, it'll tell us to remove the disk and reboot. And so, back over to here, let's minimize some of these things so that we can get a better view. Now I've put it onto a network adapter here. What would normally happen during your installation is you would have either VLAN set up or you would have it at an, uh, the port set to access for the VLAN that you uh, intend to control your VMware from. So depending on uh, how you design your environment, you may have the network adapters completely split away. Um, you may have, uh, for management at least, uh, you, you may have it so that you have both management and your uh, uh, production traffic going across the same network interfaces. Uh, there is plenty of firewalling and securing that you can set up at your network interfaces for management to prevent anybody from getting into your manage port, management port if you decide to trunk everything across the same connections. Uh, but in general, just, you know, hey, management on its own when you're setting it up, you need to know what IP address you want to use, what, uh, you know, all, the, all of your standard network information, and then, of course, you want to make sure that you have the VLAN set or tag the VLAN inside. So, and we are now able to go ahead and disconnect this. There you go. And this will should boot up fairly quickly on a brand new installation. Keep in mind a lot of this can be automated. Uh, the only issue that I've seen really is uh, disparate hardware. Uh, there, the, there is an issue with older hardware when you're trying to boot it up and it might need additional drivers or you might have a version that's not compatible with your older version. Um, I believe in version 6.7 is when they started shooting out warnings on some of the equipment that uh, that I was working with that that equipment will not be supported in version 7. So if you had an automated deployment, keep that in mind. Uh, you may want to do a manual deployment to verify that it's not going to give a warning that you need to have some type of entry in there for. Of course, when we look at an actual host, uh, pretty much all of my hosts have a minimum of four network interfaces. So this guy only has one network interface. Uh, that, that's going to make things just a little bit different. Uh, I'll, I'll show the real difference here. There we go. All right, so the real difference that you're going to find is when you're comparing this to a standard uh, physical installation, your network adapters, we only have one. But if you look at that status where it says connected, that's what you're going to want to be able to identify what the connector is and whether or not it's plugged in. So that one is. VLAN, this is where you can go ahead and set whether or not you have a VLAN or uh, the 4095 to uh, trunk it to all VLANs. Our IPv4 configuration, so if you're going to statically set it, not have DHCP do it, then uh, this is where you would set that. IPv6 uh, is, that is a lingering security issue for me. So uh, IPv6 will actually respond to any IPv6 router, and because it's not using IPv4, they're generally not found on your network. So turning off IPv6, you're going to need to reboot the system. Uh, that's just one of the defaults. I don't use it. If you use it, that means you have a router, you're paying attention, you're, you should be fine. But in general, you want to turn off IPv6 whenever you're able to. DN DNS configuration is, you know, got to set out those IP addresses to get to your DNS server. Um, 
you got to make sure that uh, you're in there with a fully qualified domain name and this is where you would set up those those you know domain names so now when we get out of here we can also test the management network um, this may actually be a good thing to do after you set up your initial network and I would say the ping addresses that you want to go for are your default gateway and uh, your DNS uh, host make sure that you can ping both of those if you have multiple DNS ping both of them and then make sure it can resolve your host name uh, this is just a, an easy you know this is this is one of your sanity checks uh, when there's something going wrong so you can do all kinds of fun you know management restore options in here that that obviously implies management backup options uh, so uh, some of the troubleshooting stuff in here you know we're, we're on a US keyboard no need to go into that the troubleshooting options in here every single one of these will be flagged by security if you're if you're putting in a secure environment so enabling the shell uh, yeah you can do it um, really when you're gonna need that is when you're not going to be able to start that. So, uh, do I think it's that big of a security issue? No, no, I don't. Uh, it, what what's implied there is that uh, somebody can get in through the shell locally, and if they can locally get in through that shell, they can probably log into this management console and enable this shell. So, I really think it's kind of a you know little little bit self defeating there, you know. Uh, enabling SSH, that's one that in general I'll leave turned off in a production environment unless I need to use it and a lot of times the the need to use it is going to revolve around things like putting out a, a ESX CLI script to establish you know the the standard network or you know something along those lines so uh, we got some good timeouts the DCUI is what we're in right now uh, and I have seen security settings that disable access to the DCUI, uh, which means that if you screw up your network in any way and you cannot get to it, you're going to have to reinstall. So keep that in mind with DCUI. Uh, it, it, it has bitten quite a few of my friends. And then, of course, you know, restarting management agents is sprinkled all through here. And we can go ahead and get into logs, reset configurations, all that good stuff. So, there we go. We can close that guy out, and at this point, we can actually dig through any of these other hosts, because this is what we would be looking at. You would connect directly to that IP address you had set on that system, set it up in your web browser, get into it, and be able to go ahead and start looking through configurations and all that. Now it's going to be a little bit of a different screen when you're going for uh, go, going for just that host. So uh, if we were to take a look at So once we get into here, obviously that's not going to be correct. You have to log in as the root user that you created. And you can see what the utilization is, all that good stuff. Um, so we have the host being managed by vCenter server. Um, what we're going to make sure of is networking is plumbed storage is good, virtual machines are good, all that. You know, so that's that's going to be one of the, you know, okay, what do I have running in here? And when you start building out your vCenter, which uh, that can be heavily scripted, um, once the vCenter is up, you'll want to go ahead and attach your host. So, uh, taking a real quick look at things like networking. So, we are actually able to look at the NSX stuff as the segment domains that they actually are. We can look at all of our distributed networking. We can look at, you know, pretty much all the piece parts down here are standard switches. All the piece parts of the network that we have. We can go ahead and look at, I believe one of the more important ones is the TCP IP stack. So making sure that you have everything set up for DNS, 
all of that. Um, you know, if you set this up initially without DNS, this is where to set it. And the firewall rules as to how people can get in and out. I want to say that the yeah, the SSH server, we can go ahead and set up who's allowed to see it and all that good stuff from right in here. And for storage, being able to see all of the different storage. Virtual machines, as I said before, being able to get into your virtual machines is going to be pretty important. Generally, when setting up a brand new environment, the first two things you set up are DNS and your vCenter server. So once the vCenter server is up, what you would do is you would go ahead and build out your data center, build out your cluster, which is as simple as new data center, give it a name, new cluster, give it a name. You can go ahead and stick with defaults and mess with it after you build your cluster out. Add your host, which would be, you know, fully qualified domain name, username, password. It'll give you a summary, tell you the thumbprint, and then allow you to add it. So once that's added, you're inside this screen, which is where you should really be operating because you're able to do things at a much higher level, be able to uh, basically create solutions for all of your nodes and readily replicate them. So when we look at the network for this guy, we look at the physical adapters and we see, you know, oh, I've got two 10 gig switches, right? Or 10 gig connections. So having these as uh, active and passive or active and active is great. What you should do is have them set as port channels if your network is designed appropriately for it. So if you've got these on a port channel, then you can aggregate their speeds. You can do, you know, there, there's a lot more failover type stuff that you can do with it. And we're going to cover that uh, when we get to the physical networking portion. All right.